Okay, hello, bonjour, salam, namaskar. I wanted to greet you all today with the greetings of the land that we're on currently in Calgary and also my ancestral land. I wrote this talk for what I thought was going to be a very different time. That was back in March when we were supposed to first start uh, or first do this talk. And of course, since then, we all know as Jonathan just spoke about as well, the whole world has changed. What I wanted to speak about has actually only become much more relevant in the world that we're currently living in. So today, I'm going to talk to you about identity and connection and what it means in this global world where we're seeing much more hate, we're seeing much more outspokenness, and at the same time, we're being limited in terms of how we can interact one-on-one -on -one because of the pandemic. So I'm gonna ask you a question. If given the chance, how many of you would actually go back to middle school or high school? So between the ages of like 13 to 17, okay? Now, if you were right in front of me, like, you know, in a regular audience space, I would probably be looking at the few of you, because I really think it's only a few of you that have your hands up and say, that was the best time of my life, right? And I'd be like, I, I don't get you. Because for me, it was not. And I don't know anyone who enjoyed those hormone surges and the changes and the acne and the blah. It was awful. Although I had friends, still now, many of them who are my loved ones, it was a hideous, hideous time. And for me, unfortunately, a lot of that time in junior high and high school was compounded by the odd times that I was called a racial slur. I remember distinctly in grade 10, there was a time when my hair was yanked back really hard because of the color of my skin. I remember all of the times that I was threatened with violence because of the color of my skin. What makes that worse is that I know there were my peers in that same school, in the same setting, they had it worse than me. That was much worse. I was just getting threatened and, you know, but that was much worse. The reality is that in our city, in Calgary today, that is still happening, not only on the playgrounds, but in our lives as adults. And I want you to hold on to that. Stop and think about how that's making you feel, right? For most of us, it's kind of a sinking, you know, feeling. And we know that people across Calgary are discriminated against every single day because of the color of their skin, because of the religious symbols they wear, because of the people who they love, because of a variety of n a number of different things. Globally, the implications and impact of this hate is compounded. At the Center for Newcomers, where I work, I have the great privilege of working with people from all over the world, people who have witnessed or been the recipient of tremendous joy and also tremendous trauma. I once had the opportunity to meet a woman from originally from Nigeria who is an LGBT plus refugee here in Calgary. And she was telling me about what had happened to her. And she told me the story and I didn't really understand it. And I, I, I knew that it was traumatic, but I didn't really understand the words. And a lot of that is because at my generation, by the time apartheid happened and, and we were kind of at the end of that, um, I was too young still to really understand. Somebody had to explain to me afterwards what she was saying. And what she was saying was this thing, this heinous thing called necklacing. And that's when a crowd, like public, they get a tire. Who knows where they get this tire from? Like the entire thing blows my mind. But they take this tire and they throw it over your head and they light it on fire. And that's called necklacing. And right now, around the world, there's over 70 countries where being LGBT 
is criminalized. And I haven't even started talking about all of the things that we face here. From our neighbors with uh, the death of George Floyd, to in Calgary, talking about Black Lives Matters, talking about murdered and missing Indigenous women, all of the issues that BIPOC people face every single day, this is the lived reality of so many of us. So in such a bleak world, where do we find hope? How do we move forward? A few years ago, the Center for Newcomers started a partnership with the Calgary Stampede. And I invited the chair and the vice chair at that time to come for a tour of the Stampede. And they came, of course, in their full regalia, their cowboy hats, you know, their bolo ties and their buckles, their cowboy boots, the whole thing. And um, after the tour, I asked them if they wanted to go for lunch. And they said, of course. So we went next door, and it was an all-you-can-eat sushi place. And as we were walking over, they both confessed to me that they had never eaten sushi before, and they'd never been in a sushi restaurant. So they were really leaving this up to me. So we get there. And the hostess that I always see is there. She's very petite, um, originally from Japan. And she sees us walk in. She says hello to me. She knows me. And she sees these two gentlemen. And this is her reaction. <gasps> cowboys! Because she had never seen real life cowboys before. And these two men didn't even skip a beat. Okay, They tipped their hat and they went, Ma'am, nice to meet you. And they kept on walking. And to me, what I love about that story was it was a natural connection made in a place and a space and in a time that was awkward and uncomfortable for those two cowboys because they had never experienced that before, but they were willing to try. So I ask again, in a world dominated by news headlines, that are bleak, and there are populist leaders like Trump, still here, and Modi, where their entire respective populations, at least 50% of those populations voted them in, and they thrive on teaching all of us about hate and about how to separate from each other. How do we, you and I, find hope? Well, in interactions like with my Stampede colleagues and the hostess, authentic, genuine new experiences, that's how. In trying new things, going to new places. And in the absence of that, like during COVID, is creating them yourselves. We can spend lots of time and energy on big talks, on strategy and research and solving these big complex issues. And of course, that's extremely needed. We do need to do those things. But in doing so, all I'm saying is let's not forget the reason we are doing that. It's because we care. Because we crave human interaction, because relationships are important to us, to me and to you, and also because it's our basic needs. There are many organizations in, in, the, in, in Calgary, like the Center for Newcomers. We have many opportunities for you. You can volunteer, get to know newcomers. You can participate in our Indigenous Education for Newcomer talks. There's all kinds of different things that we can do in the city. And we're happy to work with you to, to do that. And in a world where there are too many stories of bullying and racial slurs on the playground, like I experienced, and many children still experience today, and atrocities happening around the world, like with the LGBT plus community that some of our clients that I've worked with have experienced, and all of the other heinous crimes that we know of or we have been witness to or we have been a part of, unfortunately. I think we do need more cowboys going to sushi restaurants. I really do. I think we need more connecting one-on-one -on -one with each other. So I invite you to connect. Connect with me, connect with each other, be courageous, and I'm in Calgary. I'm definitely going to say this. Be more cowboy. If we were in the audience right now, I'd like to hear a whole bunch of yahoos, but we're not, so I digress. Take the first step, and let's see how we can further 
diversity and inclusion of all people together in our community. Thank you so much for listening to me today.